Will, is that an eye exam you're in front of? <laughs> uh, in anticipation of my, my newborn daughter uh, eventually learning the alphabet. So. <laughs> That's great. Last time I was at the eye doctor, they left the screen up before they came in to tech, check my eye. So I kind of looked at the letters and then they said, oh, read that line. I was like, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> So we're recording, we have um, a quorum. Uh, Paul's here. So I think everyone's here that um, from the trust. It's great. Uh, Paul's here? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't see him, I guess. Yeah, so we have um, John, we have you, uh, Sid, Will, Carol, Erica, hey Erica, Rob, and Paul, and Tom. Hi. Okay, that's better. Okay, well, um, I think our goal here is to come to an agreement about uh, uh, what we're going to do uh, in terms of moving this program forward. Um, we need to vote in favor of establishing the program and uh, uh, taking $250,000 of trust money, if people are comfortable with that figure, and uh, uh, moving it into a position where we can do a request for quotations um, and get a contractor to administer the program. So I think that's our goal for the meeting. Uh, we've got... Uh, a couple of other items, actually. Um, the discussion of landlord forgiveness, I sent out a, uh, a draft letter to go to landlords this morning. And, or yeah, this morning, which was my way of saying, well, maybe that's one route we can take to voluntary landlord forgiveness of rent. Um, but we'll come to that after we talk about planning for the program. Um, maybe I should start by asking Rita just to go over where we are with the design of the program or the program requirements, since those have changed since the last meeting, partly in response to that discussion, as well as in response to other things Rita's learned through uh, Shelly Goering of Mass Housing Partnership, other resources that Shelly's put us in contact with related to uh, uh, what other communities are doing. So hopefully we've got the best of uh, what we've learned and I'll leave it over to Rita to talk about some of the changes that she's made. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to step through um, as we kind of go through the, the guidelines here, issues that were questions that were raised by the um, trust members the last time and, and kind of how those were addressed in this um, second draft of the guidelines. So um, the first um, major change is um, adding a trust commitment of um, up to $250,000 um, for the combined cost of program administration and grant funds. And just making a statement that any additional funding um, would be contingent upon securing funding from other town or, or um, state resources. So that's the first one. Um, I did not incorporate the $50,000 maximum um, program administration, which we had talked about because I didn't feel like that really belonged in the, the, the program guidelines so much as it would belong in a um, in the RFQ that would go out to, to developers. Um, the next just minor tweak of the program guidelines were based on a, um, a comment that I had gotten back from Shelley Gehring at MHP, who's been doing the training on rental assistance programs and I um, sent her 
a copy of these um, guidelines after I had done a, an edit after the, um, the last meeting. And um, she pointed out, and something that was news to me, is that um, if you look at uh, bullet E there, um, the RAFT program can be rental assistance, but it can also be utility support. So we wouldn't want to disqualify a, a household if they were just getting utility support. If they were getting rental assistance, then that would be, um, that would be they, they would be excluded, but not if they were just simply getting utility support. Uh, so then if we move to um, the next change was within the income certification section. And um, after thinking this through and kind of uh, talking with Shelley a little bit about it, I had originally included that um, the maximum uh, subsidy per unit would be calculated, that, that you would first calculate what a family, let's say a household had, was able to pay something towards the rent, they didn't have zero income. And um, I was suggesting that we calculate what is 35% and then pay them the difference between 35% of their income and then our maximum um, subsidy amounts. And uh, I decided to, um, to eliminate that 35% uh, requirement because we're talking about families that are under a lot of stress and um, it just seemed a financial stress and other stress and it just seemed like a um, unneeded kind of complication both in, in doing calculations from the administrator's point of view and you know we're not paying we're not going to be able to pay the full amount of rent so why kind of penalize families if they have some income. So I did take that um, out. Um, in section four, um, I went back sort of based on our discussion last week, and um, I think that, you know, the points were very well taken about, you know, are we really providing enough money to make a difference for um, households? And as, as I said last week, you know, we're in this um, difficult position of, uh, you know, we can't pay all the rent, we can't afford to pay all the rent um, for three months for every household that might need it. I don't think there's, you know, there's going to be enough money. So what is a fair amount of money? So I went back and did some research around um, market rents in Amherst. And uh, I got to say, I was kind of taken aback when um, looking at, at what rents have gone up to. I've sort of heard, but I haven't ever searched for apartments in Amherst. So um, I increased these, the, the per month subsidy to effectively bring the subsidy amount to approximately 50% of what the rent is in a, um, not, not in one of the new developments in Amherst, but one of the um, kind of more, I don't know what you'd call it, seasoned apartment complexes. You know, I looked at where we might have um, families and tried to, to kind of come up what I thought was a, was a fair and approximately 50%. Obviously, um, in some cases, this might be less than 50%. It might be more than 50%, but we're trying to achieve some consistency and um, a figure that that's fair. And my um, recommendation was to, to, to look at approximately 50%. What that doesn't, you know, probably the one of the toughest areas is in the larger bedroom sizes because, you know, you can rent four bedroom houses in, in Amherst and, you know, the rents are um, kind of extraordinary it's it's again we're we're just having to provide some kind of some kind of limits and um i think we should talk about that some more tonight uh on john's recommendation um he really wanted a, a maximum subsidy per household so that um again we could you know we could make this 
we assist as many households as as possible. So we set that at um, the greater, you know, four thousand um, dollars, and um, so it, you could go no more than four months. Although we're initially we're setting this up as a three month um, three month program, and if there are additional funds, then maybe we would go to you know an additional month of four thousand dollars. Do you want me to stop with each one of like this section and talk about it, or do you want to talk about this at the after I go through all the changes? What's the pleasure of the committee? Do you want me to just keep running through? Yeah, go through. Okay, all right. Um, the um, the next section where there's a major change, and we talked about um, the lottery process. I think there was consensus that yes, a lottery makes sense. And so this is a pretty um, straightforward lottery approach. Uh, very often, um, well, in, in most affordable housing developments, both home ownership and rental, um, the, uh, there are lotteries that are done. And a lot of programs have lots of different buckets within a lottery because you know you might have local preference in a lottery and you have bedroom sizes and so you know it's a fairly complex process running a lottery in in this instance um, you know it's a little bit more straightforward because we're not going to be um, looking at any kind of local preference this is uh, this program's available to um, to, to residents, current residents of the town of Amherst. We're not going to be sorting by bedroom size. We're not saying we're only providing X number of dollars for one bedroom units or two bedroom units. Um, what I think the, um, the trust members do need to talk about is whether or not there are any priorities that you want to set forth in the lottery for in, which would result in maybe more than one bucket. So the things I immediately came immediately came to mind for me were do you want to have a bucket for you set a priority for households that have no income and a second bucket for households that have some income. Um, is there, do you want to um, have any kind of priority for households with children versus households without children? So that's, that's something that I think um, should be discussed um, this evening because it just needs to be incorporated into the, um, the lottery process. Um, and those are really the, you know, the big changes um, kind of based on, on the discussion um, from last week. You know, I just had one question. When you're saying the second release of funds, you mentioned that, that's, that's um, in addition to the 250000 No, no. What, what I had been thinking about um, was that you don't release all the money. You release the money in, in, two, um, in two phases. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, my concern has been, and, and I've actually heard it from some, some folks out there, that you, that you make sure that you, that it's kind of a level playing field for everybody so that, you know, if you have households, let's say, who don't have the, um, uh, who, who don't get, who haven't been helped to apply for this money. So some people might be within a network where either, uh, you know, a, a property owner, a management company, you, you live at South Point Apartments and, the landlord's going to know this is going to be available and they, you know, they help a family apply for it. Um, but if we miss households, it's just that, um, that you get kind of another bite of the apple, that if you didn't get in the first 
the, the first time around and that you would take, let's say you didn't get picked in the first lottery, then you get folded back into the, that you get into the second lottery. But it's, it's just a way of making sure that there's really um, thorough coverage. You know, we could, um, we could have a three week application period instead of doing two phases or a month long application period. But my sense is that you want to get this moving, kind of get, get it rolling. And then um, it doesn't have to be 50, 50, maybe you release, uh, you know, $150,000 initially, and then another 50 later, but it was, it's just a way of making sure that um, for people who aren't quick, that they that they could come in right right if, they, right if for instance like if a landlord really wants to be a part of this they might you know, like the bigger landlords might already be set up to do this quickly when, exactly but exactly guess, so then who yeah. i guess my question is who um who decides um you know is it for instance like with the release of funds and you have the lottery process you're saying the administrator will proceed until the first half of the program funds are awarded and then the process will be repeated but I guess to me, as an applicant, how do you know if you, you know, if you should keep, cause should keep on applying? Because it's really, you know, we're only doing a two-week application process. So, is it really only? Is it there's only one two-week application process for both release of funds, or is there a second application round? It, it, so there should be. It should be a second application round. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's how I that's how yeah. I thought it would be. That yeah. Yeah. So it's just chance to get in, not just yeah. another. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's right. And so that should be specified. So I can make that. Um, but yeah. but do you think the five days is enough? Um, so we think an, an administrator can verify the household eligibility within five day, days. Well, you know, I think we're, we're talking about um, a pretty straightforward. Um, it is. Verification process. So, um, I, and what I wrote was within five days of the receipt of a complete application. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you have a complete application, then it should be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Um, Rita and I have discussed this. I feel like we should put uh, a priority on families or households with children. Um, the, if we're trying in part to prevent homelessness and one of the things you want to do is keep people in housing because once they leave housing it's much harder to place them and that difficulty is highest i think with families with children the disruption is greatest and so my thought is that we would have essentially two eligible pools one would be families with children, and they would go into the lottery first, and uh, we would choose, uh, you know, as many families as we could uh, until we reached the point where there was still money available, and then we would go into the second pool of people who didn't weren't characterized as families of children and do that second lottery, not in the second phase, but uh, a second lottery in each phase really with the people who weren't uh, households with children. Does that run afoul of any fair housing yeah, laws? Is a question yeah. I wanted to know last time. I still, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Households or families with children are a protected class. If we were to do it the other way around, I think we would run into problems with fair housing, Carol, because then we'd be uh, excluding or uh, reducing the chances of families with children. I think, John, if we do that though, for instance, with um, you know local preference, it's capped at seventy percent. So if we said the priorities for families with house, uh, households with families or, you know, children, minors, whatever we define it as, we could run the, the whole program just for that. So if, if this is a priority category, would we say, 
you know, up to a certain percentage of the program funds, just because otherwise, you know, that, that category could deplete the whole program. Right. So, you know, whether it's like 50%, 40%, I don't know, 60%, whatever, I think we need to have a percentage in there if it is a priority, if the trust thinks it's a priority. So. I think that's a good suggestion. That makes sense to me. Otherwise, I can't imagine we won't all be used up and we should just, as Nate said, just say it's just this program just is for families with children. But I'd rather do it the way Nate suggested. Well, um, I understand the logic of that. On the other hand, from again, from my point of view, if the outcome is that we end up only serving families with children and we have reduced the likelihood of homelessness with that group, I would not be disappointed. I get I guess it I guess it seems to me likely enough that if we do it that way, no one except families with children will get it that I worry that anyone else who applies who isn't a family with children is gonna feel like they've been offered something that's fake because they never had a chance anyway. And I would like to avoid that situation. <laughs> well, I guess we need to know what other people think. <laughs> I, I, I Personally, I like the idea of, of uh, definitely give priority to the people um, who have children but I also like the 70-30 split. Um, but but I, I think that what you said, John, that families uh, with children should take should have priority. That's my view. Can you say um, can you say that at least 70% will be families with children? So so everyone's in the same pool, and if the first 30% are and it's without children, then all the rest of it can be families with children. Otherwise, it would just be, you know, you, do, you would just be working up until you've reached um, the max of 30% non-children families. Mm -hmm. Can you do it like that? Yeah, I understand it the same way. Yeah, I, I guess I'd have to think of like, right, the mechanics of the lottery then, but, um... That might work. Yeah, I agree, Nate. We don't need to get into the mechanics here. That would be something for the administrator to solve. Right. But if we say, okay, we want 70% of the of uh, uh, selected applicants to be families with children, or households with children, and then the remainder is 30%, uh, I, I think we just leave it up to the administrator to run the lottery in a fashion that makes that the result. Sure. John, uh, Chad is raising his hand. Should, do you want to allow him to speak? Sure. All right, Chad, you're, uh, you're live. <laughs> hey, Chad, is you, he, can, you can speak. Is he muted? No, he's unmuted. There we go. This is the hardest part, selection and lottery process. If we had data about the uh, universe of our town and knew which sections had, uh, you know, what percent of the market, uh, we would, you know, um, apply it equally across the whole market. Uh, you know, we could also look at it and say, wait a second, the restaurants and all these retail places have been hit the hardest. Um, Amherst is a bedroom community for Springfield. People go to Springfield and work. Uh, that's going to be open later. Uh, they're going to have more problems. Um, this is the hardest part of, of, of the whole process. Is there any statistics that let us know uh, the sections of uh, our market and how, how much uh, housing is in each section? A good question, John. Page is some, you know, some unemployment statistics, but it doesn't, you know, um, equate to or, or relate to the household type, right? I mean, it's just it's just a figure, so we don't know, you know, who's employed, whether or not they're an individual or a household, or you know, with a family or children or a partner. So, the other part is sections of the market. What are what are the hardest hit sections of the market? 
which pieces of the market are going to open latest. So I'm just trying to complicate things for you guys. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we know the answers to your questions. Maybe we'll get some idea as we see how applications come in. But I think uh, Rita's structure in which there are two application periods, and maybe we say only 60% of the money that we have available will be spent after the first application period. So we reserve a pretty good chunk in case uh, many new people come in in the second period. How will you educate the public about this program? Well, uh, that's partly the administrator's problem, but I think what we would do, what we'd be doing is going to, first of all, all the landlords in Amherst, and Nate has a list of all the and landlords in Amherst, so we could do an email to alert them to the program. Um, we would also go to local organizations that serve individuals and families, like the Survival Center, Family Outreach of Amherst, Craig's Doors, Amherst Community Connections, and so forth, and alert them to the program. Uh, basically, we do as much as we could imagine uh, would lead us to uh, as many, if not everybody, who's potentially eligible. Excellent. Is there a particular Is, question we're dealing with right now? I had another question. I just wanted to... Well, I guess we should sort of resolve the question about what it, does it mean to give priority to households with children. And it sounds like with nobody strongly objecting, uh, people would be comfortable with the 70-30 split. My suggestion was at least 70%. So, so it could be more, but it couldn't be, be more than 30% without families. So gotcha. one, one way of um, dealing with that in the lottery is that you have, um, you kind of have the, you have the two buckets, you have the families with children in one bucket, everybody else in the second bucket, you pick the maximum, if you're going to use 70%, then you pick up to 70% from the first bucket, then you can roll all the rest of those families into your second bucket. So it doesn't preclude you from picking more families with children. They just didn't get picked sort of the first round, but they could conceivably be they're, they're then put into that second bucket and could be picked in the second bucket. But Reed, I guess the question is, um, as you're running the lottery, you'd have to be um, recording um, subsidy amount too, right? Because it's also, it's not just great, we did, we did it, but if you're getting a lot of- Yes you know, larger bedroom units, someone has to be. Yeah. Yes, you have to be, run, yes, you have to be doing the calculations right. as you're pulling, right. as you're pulling names. Mm -hmm. Okay, are people comfortable with Rob's idea of it? Yes. Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, well, I guess we'll move forward with that then, which means, Tom, we could go to the issue you wanted to raise. Yeah, Rita, do you know off the top of your head how this program would, what significant differences it would have with the RAFT program, the existing RAFT program? Yeah, you know, I don't know RAFT well enough, Tom, that um, I think we've categorically excluded people who were eligible for, for RAFT. I know RAFT does first and last month, and you know, it's supposed to be a um, homelessness prevention program so um and it does emergency um, uh, utility assistance so this is you know this is complementary in some ways but i um i'm not an expert at all about raft so and raft has a limited you know they got i think five million dollars um and uh they're hoping to get more money for raft but i don't think the current amount of, of raft funds will cover all the need. 
No, I understand. Yeah. Uh, my, my question what leading up to is, if you had a agency that was administering the RAF program and could implement um, a program in Amherst instantly without any delay, by simply folding our money into their RAF money and allocating it solely to Amherst renters, um, you know, so that we would be able to immediately help people at a at maybe no administrative, you know, extra cost. I just um, I wonder if we can, when we do the solicitation for the contractors, uh, leave open. The discussion if they were to come in and say we've got a this is all very nice but we have an alternative uh, proposal that we could implement in a matter of weeks and we would charge you minimal uh, fees so there would be <laughs> open to that making more money available for the tenants I'd say the minimal fees is a, is a pipe dream, but um, well, if they're already if they're already running a program, yeah, then. I'm not sure anybody's going to do that. You know, we have certain requirements. Just they may the not, time. Rita, but I just wanted to. I just wanted sure. To yeah, no, I. We would be willing to listen to a proposal if one were presented, or whether we're locked into. Wayfinders. Wayfinders runs the RAF program in this region. So obviously we should be reaching out to them um, as part of our process of searching for an administrator. So I think we should do that, Tom, um, and see what they have to say. I'm just saying that when you do the solicitation that you include some language to suggest that we would be open to alternatives if they thought they would be significantly more expeditious. Can we can we my do that thought, legally? Yeah, you know, my only thought, Tom, there would be if the trust votes on certain things like a subsidy amount or a local preference for households with children, you know, how does the respondent change? I think usually when the town, you know, goes out for a procurement, it has to be on a, you know, a standard set of, um, you know, elements. And so, um, you know, unless, you know, I, I could see that they might have some um, maybe they have some different uh, processes, but I don't I mean to me, if like they're saying, well, we're just going to do our RAF program and give out the Amherst money through our RAF program, that's not really the same as the program we're setting up. It's, you know, uh, in terms of who we're trying, you know, the target audience or the subsidy amount. So I don't, I don't know, is that what you're asking? Like they would just essentially deliver RAF to Amherst? As well, if, I've just... This program, I, I mean, I've worked with programs for many, many years, and, and we're setting up something that uh, is pretty complicated, and it's got a lot of moving parts and could take some time to implement. And right, and it's only first somebody were able to come forward with something that was quicker and cheaper and easier to implement, would we be interested in hearing about it? Yeah. Well, I think in any event, um, whoever the administrator is, um, has to coordinate with RAFT. I mean, one of the things that I understand is RAFT has a limitation of people who are at or below 50% area median income. We're up to 80. So we may end up serving a somewhat different economically distressed population if we're between 50 and 80 and they're below 50. So there definitely needs to be coordination. Um, whether that means they could easily take it over or not is a question we can only answer by asking them. I had a question about, it seems like a, a new thing that was added here was households, I'm looking at program guidelines, eligible households, have insufficient income and or assets to cover rent for a three month period. I don't remember the three month period and, and that's probably even okay. But the part that seems really hard is how are you going to figure out whether someone has an income forecast for three months from the date of application? Nobody knows what is going to happen in the next two weeks, let alone three months. So that seems like just a kind of a, I would rather not have, a requirement that seems 
so impossible to to do anything with. I, I just like I don't know how anyone is supposed to forecast that. So I'd rather not have it in there. Yeah, that's less a forecast, Carol, than an existing at at present that you don't have assets. I know uh, that's the that's the thing though. I mean, you don't know. I was laid off, say, and maybe I'm gonna go. Maybe I'm gonna go back to work within that three months. Maybe I'm not. I mean, I have no idea. I don't know how I would forecast three months. Yeah. The main kind of income that could be forecasted would be unemployment insurance. So if someone's eligible for that and they're getting the extra six hundred dollars a week bump, uh, the way it's set up under the CARES Act then there we probably would not want to serve that individual or that family which i think is the reason for talking about income forecasted uh i agree carol that you can't forecast whether someone's going to be coming back to work after a layoff or after being fired um and i don't think that's what we're asking for we're asking where they actually know whether or not they have income coming in in the next three months. If they don't, then the forecast is zero. If they do, then as in the example with unemployment insurance, there, there is an amount that we can talk about. Okay, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure how much more information you get by saying that than just saying what's your income now, but whatever. I think it's trying to get, do you have assets now too? So that you may, you might not have income now, but if you had a ten thousand dollars savings account, where okay, um, you could access those funds. That's really what that is supposed to. Should should we say assets okay. then? If I'm if I'm reading that, I don't see I don't I wouldn't read that as for calculating for you know using it says assets. assets. It yeah. says income and or assets. So does that need to be made more clear? Wait, where does it say that? Yeah, I don't see the word assets either. It says how some it will be calculated based on current household income and income forecast for three months. If you look under program guidelines and eligible households. Yeah, it's, okay, it's up here. It's right there in F. Okay, I think you just have to repeat that. Okay, just repeat it in the other part. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Carol, I think it's a funny thing, but you know, um, like business um, business loans through Block Rant or other things, they're all they're all kind of doing a kind of just a kind of a litmus test of what your income is, and they're trying to do you know rather than just say what is it now, a lot of them are using a three month forecast um, just to show that there is an impact from, from COVID. So I, I agree it's a little difficult. And, you know, on a lot of webinars I've been sitting in on, people ask the same question, well, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen in a month. How do I do a forecast? And, um, you know, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, do you anticipate anything? If not, then it really might be that there's not, you know, you don't have any income to report for the next three months, but at least, you know, we're, we're kind of taking it on faith. We're not asking them to supply anything. Yeah. Um, well, actually, uh leads me to another question I had, which was, when I look at the timeline of this, like somebody might get money in July and they won't have been kicked out of their apartment because there can't be any evictions right now, but people who are gonna help, can they use this money for arrears rent? Because probably they couldn't pay rent between now and whenever, the th and whenever they get the money. So, it may not, so three months of forecast may actually be if you go from when they were not able to pay rent anymore, maybe the past three months, not the next three months. And, and that, really, I don't mean to connect the two. What I wonder is, can, and what difference would it make to the program description, but can this money be used to pay the rent that you already weren't able to pay? So that's a good question. There are some communities that are doing that. That's not specified here. It's been it's been looked at kind of um, projecting forward, but it could go back, you know, to and you'd have to decide what is that 
you know, what is that starting point? When right. did they not be able to start paying rent? So is it, you know, when did people lose their jobs? I don't know, March 1st, when did layoffs begin? So you'd have to pick a point certain and say you could go back. But, you know, you could have somebody that wasn't paying their rent in January or February, but they were still working. But you, you'd if, you not. if you said, if you have rent in arrears back to March 1st or something or other, because that's when this all started whamming people in March and April, mm -hmm. because I don't, it's going to be weird for a landlord to agree, I'll accept this month, this July, August and September month rent or whatever, but even though you still haven't paid me for March, April or May, mm -hmm. I've, most people, most people who collect money for anything want to apply it first to the oldest debt and then mm -hmm. work their way up. Mm -hmm. So I just. And so that's a question. What if, um, just a question. So, you know, knowing the rent uh, terms in Amherst would, um, are we asking for tenants to provide a lease? For instance, what if they, what if the lease expires, you know, in June um, or in August, you know, those are likely the likely times. Are we, you know, we're not asking where are they, you know, do they have a new lease or if they have a new house, we're just saying we'll help you with, you know, your expenses, right? So we're not really concerned if their lease has been renewed or if they have a new lease, it's really just. Well, they're staying in the program. It's dependent on having their having a lease or an agreement with the landlord. So, if that uh, lease or agreement ends on a certain date, uh, then you know I would hope, in the interest of housing stability, that they would be able to continue to stay. They'd have a new lease, and therefore they, uh, the landlord, could continue to receive the rent subsidy from us but you know so at time of application would we need that from someone i mean i just i feel like that a lot of leases expire in june probably yeah so we probably uh, need to know yeah, when the any application from the yeah the the agreement with the landlord yeah. but i'd like to get back to carol's question because i think that's a that's something we should resolve um if you i guess i i guess I guess I, I always thought that maybe we were dating it as of March 1st or whenever things started happening because, you know, the renters are still, they're collecting, a, I mean, they're, you know, they're collecting arrears. They're not, a, you know, they're not, you know, any rent they haven't paid is just stacking up. So to me, it's, um, I mean, money's fungible. So I, I don't know, maybe we have a start date. Yeah, I think that should be in the, in the program guidelines. Not the April first, because you should have paid your month, your paid your March rent on March first before the, layout, the shutdown started. It seems like April first. April is the first month that you might not have been able to pay rent if you were affected by COVID. Okay. Yeah. Basically, the rental. Could, we could use them, they could use the money to pay rental arrears going back uh, three or four months from the date of the award. I think it'd be cleaner if we said, you know, as of April 1st, yeah. right? So yeah, I think the landlord would, can develop, you know, could write a statement as to, you know, for that. That's fine with me. Um, my only hope is that while well, the landlord still can't evict them because uh, of the new state eviction law. Uh, and I guess any money that we give them is a way of preventing eviction when that law expires. Right. So I'm fine with uh, dating back to April 1. I support April 1. 
I do as well. Just go, just want to let folks know that I have to leave in the latest five minutes. I have another oh, meeting at eight that I have to be at. Well, it's so, the latest. <laughs> latest. I got a, I got a eight o'clock that I absolutely have to be at. Thank you. Another Zoom meeting? Yes, it is with the big boss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, well, um, have we wrapped up changes in the program requirements? Are there any other comments on what uh, Rita has presented? I just have a really quick question. If you could go where the rents are. Um, so you said up to three months, but if someone has a uh, hundred, uh, I mean a thousand one hundred, three months is going to be more than four thousand. It's four thousand four hundred. Yeah, I, I don't know if we need to have that greater than four months since we, okay. at this point, we only have a three month program. Okay, so just leave it at three months. We'll probably okay. drop that out. Yeah. Yeah, that confused me a little too. Yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yeah, what so, about, um, um, what about uh, low-income homeowners um, who can't make a mortgage? Is there any program for them? There, there, so there is, I mean, there's the, the other there. programs, Rob, but this is not for that, I guess. Yeah, there and are. In any event, um, there are restrictions on CPA money, which make it more difficult for us to use this as a mortgage subsidy program. So we're, I won't say we're stuck with, but what we're best able to do with CPA money is a rental assistance program. Yeah, homeowners can, you know, basically, I think it's 180 days, they can not pay it and they just put it on the end of their mortgage. Um, so there is that, that program um, it also applies, I learned this week, that um, a homeowner occupied um, units of four units or less. So, you know, if there's a four unit building with a homeowner and they rent three, they also qualify for that mortgage um, program. So, you know, they, you know, they could, you know, it's, you know, it'd be great if they had rental assistance too, but then they, you know, actually they, because they have a mortgage relief, they don't have to pressure tenants to pay rent um i mean they still might want to but you know i don't know how many homeowners know of that it's one of those things that you know it's all in the detail of the of the legislation and everything i don't know how broadly all that stuff is getting out there so rita uh how many uh um renters do you think this will benefit depending on how if we do the 200 000, i forget what the number was john 250 50, but assuming 50 of that might be for administration. Okay, so 200,000, what would be your estimate of people being served? You know, Paul, I really have no sense because I don't know if we're going to get all three bedroom units. I mean, it really depends upon um, what, the, what the demand is. And I, I don't, you know, mm -hmm. anecdotally, I tried to talk to a few people just like Amherst Family Outreach. I mean, they were talking about um, families that they're already seeing. So, but I didn't, they didn't have specifics on, on, um, on bedroom size, you know, sort of a breakdown. It's, uh, I don't know. I tried, I, I did, I tried to like run some numbers and I thought I'm just operating in a void of information. So hard to, hard well, to well, Is there a range that you could estimate? Not without getting pulling up my calculator. And okay, to, I think we should just, know that. I just, yeah. I just did my calculator. If you take yeah. two hundred thousand dollars and divide it by thirty-three hundred dollars, which is the most a family could get, you'd yeah. have sixty families. That's How many? They're all families. Sixty. Sixty. Yeah. yeah that was yep. everybody at the maximum, right? Yeah. Yeah. The maximum. So that's. Yeah. So you won't serve fewer than sixty families right. if the administration right. stuff doesn't cost more than fifty thousand dollars. Right. And, right. and do we know what the need is by any chance? We don't. And yeah, related to that, if it's less than sixty, is the is the administrative fee going to still be fifty thousand? Is it going to be fifty thousand whether it's ten families or sixty families? 
Or? Yeah, so it's based on the dollar. It's an interesting question, actually. But um, my guess is if we put 250000 and someone is going to estimate, okay, well, that 250000 you know, part of that is the administration money and part of it's the subsidy money. And then the award goes to whoever has the lowest subsidy, you know, administration money. So, you know, someone's going to be doing the same thing we're doing. Okay, you know, I mean, I came up with you, you know, 80 families, right? You know, depending on how the breakdown works. So it's kind of up to the um, administrator to say, okay, well, my administration fee is 25%. I'm going to quote 50. You know, my administration fee is 20%. I'm going to do something less, you know, or whatever the numbers are. So it's really, it's independent of how many households are helped. It's really based on the dollar, the program dollars. But, I mean, right, but, but what if all the dollars don't go out? Is there any chance that all the dollars won't go out? But we'll still have to pay the entire um, administrative fee of 50000 Hard to believe the dollars won't go out. I think if we exhaust, don't exhaust the dollars with the three month program, then we would allow applicants to come back and ask for an additional three months. So I think one way or another, the dollars are going to go out. Uh, I mean, the information about levels of unemployment, um, problems families had paying rent even before the COVID-19 pandemic started to hit us suggests to me that uh, we're going to be more likely overwhelmed than underwhelmed by, ap by applicants. Um, but you don't know. It's a risk. And I should say, when we're talking about the risk, um, if we put $250,000 into it, that's $250,000, <clears> excuse me, that we might not get back easily. Uh, right. You know, there's concern now about what's happening with the CPA program statewide and whether the towns are gonna get much of a match. They were originally promised in the legislative budget that they'd get a higher max than they have in the past. But with the revenue situation being problematic for the state, that may not happen. So we don't know what kind of CPA money will be available in the future. So I have to say that on the one hand, I was thinking when we did this, that, oh, the 250 will come back to us next year Frankly, I'm not so certain about that right now. Rob, to your pro question, I mean, here's the, um, you know, the contractor scope about, you know, there's program payments and reporting. Um, I was just thinking, Rita, if everything's monthly, maybe we just make the contractor invoices to the town monthly. And so, you know, we're saying, we're telling the contractor, we pay the administration fees and programmatic costs based on invoices. So, the idea would be that they, you know, we'd only pay knowing that participants are getting service. So that's not to say we, we'd we spend all the administration dollars and not get all the money out, but I, I'd like to think that it would, you know, it would correlate. Um, yeah. There'll be some, I think we just have to gauge that because there's some upfront um, costs that are, uh, that have to be front front loaded. But yeah, no, it's, yeah. Like uh, marketing. You know, be... appli an application intake, because you could have 500 applications and then, um, uh, you know, only 100 people are eligible, that sort of thing. So that's, you know, that's something we have to, we have to think about of just not, not having it evenly, um, like 33%, because you have, you have more, more costs initially. But we would we we wouldn't um, have here something about um, in this area or in the program guidelines. To Rob's point about having something, you know, documentation of of you know um, um, like complete you know participation before final payment to to administrator. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think we're getting into the contract stuff with the administrator yeah. that that the town needs to be 
<laughs> I know. Looking at kind of what standard practice is with this sort of thing. So yeah, usually, we, right, we, yeah, we usually break down like maybe a few different payment percentages. And, right. So, yeah. so I don't think that's, I, I think that's, that's a good, good point. I don't think the, the trust yeah. Um, yeah. needs to specify what the, what the contract, um, what's in the contract. Yeah, but I mean, I think Rob, to your point though, the only thing I could see happen is if, you know, the dollars don't round out, right? We don't know how the lottery works and then what the subsidy amount is. So it's a maximum subsidy amount. There could be differing subsidy amounts. So, you know, it's kind of up to the administrator, the math and see if they can, you know, make the money work, right? Um, to get it all spent out. Well, with the first round, we're not too worried about that. It'll happen when they do the second round of applications uh, to obviously spend the money as closely as possible to the maximum. Okay. But again, I don't think that's something we need to worry about now. Yeah. Right. So are there further questions about this program or things that people think need to be changed? Are we comfortable voting to take $250,000 in housing trust money and put it toward this program? Can I, well? ask, one, can I ask just one other question, which is, how much money does that leave the housing trust with, if any? It probably leaves us with a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Is that right, Nate? Yeah, I was gonna say around one hundred fifty thousand. But you know, some, some of, of that money is for right? some of that money is for um, you know consultant fees and consulting, and then there's the general development pot that the trust has. So the trust has almost four hundred thousand or. A little over three hundred and fifty thousand, I think, in just general development funds. But, but um, you know, I think trust wouldn't have a lot of money after this. So, yeah, there's still some. You know, the, the, the trust voting this is saying priority, and then, like John said, you know, it's continuing to ask CPA for other money. Um, you know, I think the value of the trust is that we don't need necessarily a, a council vote in a big process if we want to move this forward. But it does, you know, right. for instance, say um, a project all of a sudden came out of, you know, another project really needs some money, the trust would have to consider, do we, you know, put the rest of our resources to something else too? Um, Thank you. I, I'd like to add, I, I think the trust should be voting this. I, I support this. Uh, I think the trust should uh, expect to vote this because it's a high priority and not expect reimbursement. If we're voting it based on that, I think that's not a, we should really have that conversation. Um, but I think this is a high priority. We should vote the funds, uh, not expecting to be reimbursed, but hoping that we do get reimbursed and, and re, 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 um, refresh our funds. Will, you had something you wanted to say. I thought. Oh, I was mostly just expressing my support for the program. Okay. I support the program too. It's a it's an immediate need, and our focus has always been on reducing the possibility of homelessness. Yep. And right now, the situation is so dire for so many families. And I agree that prioritizing families, especially single households, too. Um, I think this is really important, and I I support it. Okay, are we ready to come to a vote then? Yes. Uh, okay, there's a motion to uh, support this program in the amount of $250,000 and ask the panel to move it forward as expeditiously as possible. So moved. I second it. Okay, so I guess we need a roll call since. Mm -hmm. the, uh, on the air or whatever. So I'll start with myself uh, and say I vote in favor. Uh, let's see, how do we do this? I can, well, I can see on, on my screen, Paul, how do you vote? Yes. 
Uh, Will, how do you vote? Yes. Tom? Yes. Rob? Yes. Uh, now I'm missing Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. And do we lose Sid? He left, I think. Yeah, I think he, he had to leave for another meeting. Did I miss anybody? Yourself, John, I guess? Yeah, I did say myself first, yes. Okay, so basically we have everybody who's now here in favor, and I'm sure Sid would have been in favor, but I can't vote for him. <laughs> okay, um, so there are a couple of other things for us to look at. Uh, last time there was a question about uh, whether there's a way to get landlords to forgive rent based on the fact that we're contributing. And so I heard that and was thinking about it and decided that the only thing I could come up with is to send a landlord to a letter. A letter. This would happen after an agreement was signed between the tenant, the landlord, and the town. So basically the deal was sealed and then as soon thereafter as possible, a letter of this would go to the landlord. It could be signed by me. It was also suggested it might be signed by Paul or it might be signed by both of us. So uh, what does anybody think of this approach? I will say I had a conversation with Nancy Schroeder about this and I assume Nancy's not on the call. Uh, and Nancy was honestly skeptical that landlords, given the fact that they've been hit pretty hard by losses of revenue with the fact that students aren't around and many of them appear to have walked away from their existing leases would make it more difficult for landlords to do this. That's not to say we shouldn't ask, but um, it does mean we may not be doing something that uh, is going to work out. And as Nancy suggested, it may even annoy some people. Yeah. I, I think if, unless you can build it into the program, I wouldn't bother. I mean, if, if we get over, one of the, one idea was if we get a whole bunch of things we have to choose from people not to, if, a landlord is saying, well, I'll take 80%, that would raise this up to a higher level in terms of awarding funds. Yeah, but you can't, you can't do that if you've got yeah. a program and people are expecting, they're going to say, wait a minute, there's a rule that you didn't write down that said that, you know, unless you can build it into the program and provide incentives and yeah. things, I wouldn't bother asking a voluntary contribution, John. Okay. Um, well, that's why I offered it up. Um, it's not something that we're required to do, but I thought I would at least operationalize the idea yeah. and see what people think. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, Tom, this is also, I, I get it. So it is tricky. Some of it was also getting at, you know, could we help prevent eviction, right? If, if the, the rental subsidy is a, a stopgap measure, is there anything else we could do? But um, I agree landlords may not find this, you know, might be skeptical and not take this too kindly, but. They're running a yeah, business. I, I was going to say also there, there are lots of landlords who don't like to rent to families. And so I think this is, you know, these landlords who are renting to families are probably a little bit more, you know, giving. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I would say too that they're probably um, struggling themselves. Well, it sounds like the sentiment is not to go to try to get landlords to provide uh, voluntary rent reductions. I don't know. I'm kind of of the mind that, I mean, the way that the letter is written, it's not particularly, I, it's not offensive to me. <laughs> Granted, you know, <laughs> I'm not in the rental market. It sounds like pretty voluntary talking about partnership, you know, recruiting people to join the effort to, uh, it's like, I don't really see a, I, I don't see the cost in sending it personally, but um, but that's just me. 
I am kind of in the same place Will is, although I might be inclined to write it so that it doesn't ask so much for a specific amount of reduction, but any reduction, but some amount of reduction. So if somebody can't do a whole match what we're doing, but they could do a little, that would be better than nothing. And if it's written, to me, if it's written kind of like it is, like, gee, this is a request, and if there's anything you can do, it would be, it would greatly help us be able to help more people. I don't, but I don't, I don't know the rental market either. I don't want to make somebody particularly angry, but it, if it has no strings attached, because the thing's already been done, you already got the money you can get from us. We're just asking if there's any way that you can help, but I'm also happy to go with whatever everybody else thinks. John, uh, Janet McGowan has raised her hand. Would you want her to speak or have the trust still speak on this a bit? Sure. No, we can invite Janet. All right, Janet, I'm going to allow you to talk. I think you're all set if you unmute yourself. All right, Janet, you're if you unmute yourself, you I can try to unmute you as well. Oh, I got it. Like, I got it. I'm sorry. Okay. This is my weak skill. Um, I just appreciate all the effort that is going into this. Um, and I actually think this is a good idea. And I speak partly as a landlady myself, um, where I really value the stability and not having to, you know, have people move out and keep people in. And I recognize that this is, I'm providing in my small, in my two family house is homes for people. And, you know, I think about their lives too, not just, you know, rent and what I can get. And so I think that if you're just asking, and also it's a business. And so asking someone to lower the rent you know, with the idea that the town is providing some money and people are in bad shape, I don't think that would make me angry. I could just, I might feel bad saying no, like, no, I need that missing piece. But I think it's, it's, I don't think this would hurt people's feelings or enrage them or anything, but I do think it's a good idea. And landlords are probably, especially in Amherst, really wanting to keep tenants in their homes. If they're already having problems with student rentals leaving, their goal is, you know, keeping as many people as possible. Um, and the other thing is nobody really wants to go after missed rent. And so that's a really torturous process that probably doesn't lead to much. You know, you could be in housing court or you could be <coughs> or you could be in small claims court trying to get money from people. And maybe the, the pitch is, hey, we can, you know, if you shrink it down, we're helping people get through this hard time. And at the end of it, you go back to the regular rent. I think that's pretty compelling. And so my pitch would be just there's something wrong with asking people can just say no if they don't or if they're not comfortable with it so that's it thank you thanks thanks janet thank you uh, following up on what janet said i think um at the end of at the end of this at the end of three months or, or however long it lasts i presume there will be a report you know we helped x number of families with with two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand whatever it comes to be of subsidies, if the if the landlords can, you know, kick in ten percent or twenty percent, then we can report a greater amount of subsidy. You know, they 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 if they report to us, well, we reduce the the rent the rent by a hundred dollars for um, twenty families. That's another um, twenty thousand dollars that we that that we were able to um, leverage. Yeah. Uh, That's a good point. Uh, Chad has a comment, John. I'm going to let him speak. Sure. All right, Chad, you're you're able to speak. Just my thought that um, the landlords are also permitted uh, relief from the federal government as far as um, being businesses. Okay. Well, I can change the text of the letter, uh, I think consistent with Carol suggested, to make it by, uh, for next month by an equal amount or a smaller amount. So that softens it a little bit or it doesn't make the, the bar so high for working with us. Well, at first, I thought sentiment was swinging against this. Now it seems to be moving perhaps more in favor. Why don't we, uh, I'll move that 
we include sending out this letter as part of the program. Uh, and uh, is there a second? I second it. Or with yeah. all the changes that were recommended. Right. Okay. So now we'll poll our group and see uh, whether people think it's worth doing or not. What are we voting on, John, exactly? We're voting on whether to send this letter as amended uh, under the circumstances that I described before, that is after a, uh, a rental agreement between the landlord and the town and the tenant have been, uh, have been reached. So time for discussion. I was going to bring up, have we identified who's the, um, who's sending the letter? Is it just the trust or is it the town and the trust or how are we <laughs> managing that? Paul, what do you think about that? Uh, I think it's, I think it's more powerful coming from the trust actually. Because they're probably paying taxes to the town and they hate that doing that. So the trust is a better source and it's going to extend the trust's money anyway. Okay, so that resolves that question. Thanks, Nate. So let's do a vote or of the group and decide whether to move forward with this or not. Uh, Nate, do you, well, I, I just see, I see people on the screen, so I'll just start with Will. Uh, yes, I'm in favor. Carol? Yes. Rob? Yes. Uh, Paul? Yes. Uh, okay, now I'm losing people on screen. Erica? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I'll vote in favor, yes. Is there anybody opposed or anybody I missed? Okay, then we resolve that. Um, I had uh, one other question really, and that is whether we should ask town council to not so much approve, but say, okay, we like the fact that you're doing this program. Um, because it's trust money, we have the authority to do that without asking for their approval. So we don't need to go to them we can do it in a way that doesn't necessarily hold us up. I guess, uh, and I'm assuming they would approve it and that would be a good thing for them and for us. Uh, on the other hand, I suppose the have to ask what the consequences are if they say, no, I don't think you should do this. <laughs> so I, I'm inclined to do it, uh, to try to get it on their calendar as soon as we can. Um, hopefully they don't refer to committee. <laughs> um, may I suggest that you just write them and saying we're doing this um, and not ask for permission. Um, I think time is of the essence for this. We've got people who are going to be missing rent payments and um, I think you would, you, I think that they, I think you're, I think they would tend to support it, but they will have a, if you're asking them for to vote on something, which I don't think you should be doing, it's not their role. Um, and you know, but I think that they should certainly be informed about what the trust is doing. Okay, we'll definitely do that then. And um, rather than seeking their approval or recognition or whatever. Um, I like that. Okay, um, I did put up a, a, a an an implementation schedule draft. Um, I think that anything significant on there we've already covered, but uh, again, I don't know if this is exactly the way it works, but uh, maybe it can be expedited a little bit. I don't know how much. I just wanted to give people a chance if they had to ask questions about the implementation schedule. It includes in it, uh, in uh, italics, an assumption that we may eventually get 
additional money into the program through the Community Preservation Act Committee. I know I've talked to Nate Buddington and he's interested. Uh, the problem is the uncertainty about uh, CPA funds, uh, even those that were allocated last year. Uh, there may be a problem, and it may be that CPAC will have to revisit uh, its recommendations from last year. Um, they did have some money theoretically available for housing that could go to this. Um, but again, I think there's uncertainty with the state budget, and as a consequence, uh, Sonia Aldrich is not comfortable at this point having the committee meet and really do go through this exercise, which I can understand. Uh, nonetheless, I kind of optimistically put a place <laughs> for it in the calendar. I have a question about if it seems uh, it seems both maybe overly complicated and also like it would it would not be maybe the incentive you would want to give to whoever the administrative your administrator you pick in the first place is to have the whole thing go out for another request for proposal things if you get more money when somebody's already set up to do it if they've been doing it well there may be some law that makes it impossible but I would like to see that whoever got the first one is at least prime candidate to just keep on keeping on with the program if there's more money and not have to go through the whole process over again. It seems like a disincentive to anybody who, who took it on in the first place and, and a lot of extra work for everybody else. But I don't know about Maybe. the legalities of it. I. Uh, from talking to Nate, and he can clarify further, um, if we go through an RFQ process, which is an expedited process, um, we can't later amend the contract for a significant amount of additional dollars. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, um, yeah, public procurement has some restrictions on that. I mean, we could, you know, tighten the time frame in, in a way that it makes it more difficult for the people who aren't implementing a program to be able to respond and meet the timeline. But, you know, the idea is we can't, I mean, without knowing that these funds are available um, or will be available, I don't think the trust could put it out saying, you know, it's a $500,000 program because we just don't know that they're there. So I know, you know really it's, it'll be two separate programs. Um, I agree. I mean, it stinks. We'd have to go through a whole nother procurement process, but if we, if we find that the first one's working well and we like the rental amounts and uh, the way the administrator is working, you know, we can, you know, we can try to expedite it, but we still have to do some type of procurement. Okay. Okay. Any other questions related to the schedule? Okay, then I think we're wrapped up as far as discussion of uh, emergency programs concerned. I certainly thank everybody for coming back to this a week after you had also a very thorough discussion. Um, we had a couple of I other items that you had on the agenda, Nate. I just quickly, has there been a vote on the overall program? Am I did we vote? I mean, we took a vote, but I just want to make sure that was on, was it on everything or was it? So, um, from, from the notes, it's both approving the program and the allocation, but it would be better to separate those votes. But that's up to John. Uh, well, I, I don't know exactly why. When I thought about it, I think you're allocating $250,000 for a particular program. So it makes sense to vote for both at the same time. Yeah, we think that's clear, yeah. All right. Okay, um, then the other items that we had on the agenda. Um, I know there was discussion last time about UMass residential development based on an exchange of emails that I had with uh, Tony 
and there was a question about inviting Tony and or Nancy to our next meeting to update us and talk about uh, respond to questions. I, I haven't done that, but I could do that. Just, just a point of order, John. This meeting was specifically for uh, dealing with the emergency around the, the funding and our next regular meeting was going to pick up where we left off on the rest of the items. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think this was included, Tom, just so John knows if he does invite Tony and Nancy back, you know, what, you know, what, what would they be asked, you know, to present or if there's anything the trust really wants them to come back with. Well, hearing no comments, uh, I also will say I, I don't have anything that I'm prepared to discuss about legislative issues at this time. The biggest news was the eviction news, which I think everybody is familiar with. So um, I don't think there's any need to prolong the meeting, Tom. I agree. Uh, is there anything anybody else wants to add as a last comment? Well, just quickly, would we ask Tony and Nancy to come to the next regularly scheduled meeting and discuss you know, the student housing projects, or do we want to push it off a meeting? Um, And the trust is meeting pretty shortly. So I don't know, you know, we had said May 14th, John, at 6 p.m. Is that still good for everyone? Not that we have to invite UMass then, but May 14th as a regular scheduled meeting. I don't think there's any clarity on what the university is doing. They're not going to know anything more in two weeks than they know now. Right. So I wouldn't suggest you invite them in. It's just going to be saying that we don't know. Well, that's part of the problem, Paul, is that they keep, uh, saying that they don't know and they're waiting for others to tell them what the program's going to be. And we thought maybe since they have professed to be deeply caring about the affordability of the project that we might get them to proactively define what they mean by affordability before the developers tell them what they want them to do. That's all. Yep. Well, I, sorry. Someone else wanted to say something? Well, I'll invite uh, Tony and Nancy and say we'd like to talk about the issue of affordability. And if they feel they are not in a position to talk about it or anything else related to these projects prospectively, then I guess we'll put it off till a later date. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other last comments? Nate, you look like. No, Chad just raised his hand. Allow Chad to talk. Yeah, just announcements. Um, uh, 132 Northampton and East Street School. Um, there are no real announcements on either of those. I think for the East Street School, we need to contract for an analysis of the wetlands and also the hazardous materials in the building. Nate's in the process of doing that. For 132, uh, Valley is preparing a special permit that will go before the ZBA. Uh, I assume sometime next month, but it's a little uncertain. The ZBA is just getting training actually earlier today because uh, they have a lot of new members. So there was training on uh, their responsibilities and how to process applications, I guess. Um, that training actually was being recorded online. So if anybody is interested in it, there'll be a link on the town website somewhere. Uh, and it might be interesting to take a look at it. I I'm sorry, I just meant for the next, uh, the next agenda. Oh, I, I I haven't thought about the, our agenda for the next meeting. <laughs> I've just kind of gotten myself together to prepare for this one, Chad. <laughs> so I, I don't have anything to say about that at this time. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll have report back on how we're moving ahead on the short-term rental assistance program 
uh, whether we're going to have Tony and Nancy, uh, you know, we'll see what, what comes up. Uh, hopefully we'll have heard that con there are new contracts for uh, the analysis of the East Street School property, including the building and also for Strong Street, since I'd like to be able to move ahead uh, if we can with those projects. But we'll see where we are in a few weeks. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we ready to adjourn? All those in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 I, think, I think the ayes have it. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you for participating. Uh, great to see you all. Glad you didn't have to look for a new housing trust chair. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you to the people who worked on all this stuff between just one week and brought it back to us this week also. Yeah. Thank you to them. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good evening.